Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to present this uh, lecture. CP and CP-like conditions have many different impairments. Because I'm a pediatric orthopedist and most of my experience is in the realm of the musculoskeletal and motor control area, I will focus on that, on both where we are and where I think we should be going. This does not deny that there is equally important deficits in many children in behavior, cognitive areas, as well as neurologic complications like seizures. The goals of childhood management, which we've heard a lot about at this conference, is to maximize function. And for me, that means really the focus is maximizing function at maturity, since most of us, and children with cerebral palsy as well, will live five times longer as adults than children. And we use the framework for defining outcome measures as presented by the ICF outline from the World Health Organization. The underlying assumption that we have made with a lot of the musculoskeletal treatment has been that body function and structure remain stable in adulthood. Activity and participation may decrease due to early aging. However, we don't have very much evidence that this is true. And for this reason, we have focused on doing a callback study of patients treated at our facility using gait analysis. And uh, the initial report uh, from the first 100 patients who are now about 30 years old, we called back patients a mean of 25, to, who were between 25 and 45 years old. I should note that three-fourths of these patients are GMFCS 1 and 2, and the, most of the remaining GMFCS 3. The result from the body function area based on gait analysis, the GDI, which measures impairment of general body gait, shows that they are definitely below normal in the gray bar, and their adult function is only slightly less in the red bar compared to their adolescent assessment in the blue. This is also true for stride length and gait velocity. Their GMFM dimension D has not changed at all. The patient reported outcomes based on the PROMISE instrument demonstrates that they do have reduced physical function that's statistically significant compared to their age-matched peers from the National PROMISE database. However, depression, participation, and pain were not statistically significant. In fact, as you note here, depression and pain were slightly less than age-matched peers. So our conclusion at this point for GMFCS 1 to 3 patients, that their motor function remains stable, pain, depression, and participation measures are really close to their age-matched peers, which is consistent with some reports, some other reports. However, it's not necessarily the general perception when we hear talks on function in adulthood. So the conclusion specific to GMFCS 1 to 3 is that adolescent function is maintained. Therefore, our goal of childhood management should be to maximize function at the end of growth in both physical activity, participation, and I feel also in psychological and social function. The childhood orthopedic care is focused on improving activity, participation, and quality of life. That's our goal. In GMFCS 1 to 3, that means primarily maximizing mobility. In GMFCS 4 and 5, the focus is on hip health, managing spinal deformity, comfort care, which means usually tone and contracture management. The management goals often are assessed with short-term outcomes. So we have to ask, uh, the treat, what is the treatment benefit of three, six, and 12-month outcomes uh, of a specific study? 
We should ask what the quality of life improvement is in the short term. Is it worth the investment of the study? Because what we really should focus on, I feel, is the long-term outcome at maturity. So another way to ask or consider this is, does the treatment we are providing at age six improve the outcome for the child at age 18? To understand that, we need to understand the natural history, and we must have control groups over this long term if we are to understand treatment effect. And this is one of the real problems that we have in studies today, is we have very little good, objective, long-term natural history studies. Here's an example of what is probably a typical natural history, a five-year-old boy that I have treated with a uh, relatively uh, uh, minor surgery uh, from five to 10. He did well, he was walking with crutches. But then during adolescent growth, he had a rapid deterioration and he ended in a wheelchair by age 13. The reason for this is natural history. However, this boy had very poor social and family structure, poor motivation, no physical therapy, and no orthopedic follow-up. So we need to have this kind of comparison, which we have very few of. What we have more is this kind of child who is sort of the opposite end from a very uh, healthy uh, family that is uh, very involved. The boy is a high intellect, uh, intellect, is very motivated, has excellent physical therapy, and has also had consistent orthopedic follow-up and timely intervention. And he now, at age 25, walks around everywhere in the community using a single crutch uh, with uh, no dependence on his uh, wheelchair. Here's another example of the importance of natural history. You see this girl at age three. She has this very severe plano valgus foot. At age six, the foot is corrected. And at nine, it's actually overcorrected a little. So if we were doing some intervention, I would show this to tell you how excellent our outcomes are. However, this is a girl who had no treatment this is natural history. We have to always consider that the impact of natural history may be more significant than our treatment. The natural history of predicting outcome in young children is another dilemma that we face often before families. The excellent uh, uh, definition of the GMFCS system for communication has been plotted on the GMFM scale, and it's so convenient because you can plot where the two-year-old, now GMFCS2 is, and we can tell the family exactly where they're going to be when they're 20. However, this does not work. This is too simple. Children are not rocket trajectories of development. They don't follow this nice mathematical scale. This is more what you are faced when you're seeing this young child whom you have assigned a GMFCS level. And this girl, which I previously showed you with a GMFCS level three, ended up being a high functioning GMFCS level two. But I can also equally show you patients from my practice who at the same level, age three, end up being poor functioning GMFCS threes. We need more data, more granular data, to understand what is driving these changes. And many people I know are working on that. We need to understand the natural history of things like spasticity. And the Swedish group uh, under Gunnar Hägland have done a superb job in a, also in a recent publication documenting the same, that spasticity peaks at three to four years of age and then has a gradual decrease just as part of neurologic growth and development. The natural history of strength is that the eight-year-old is much stronger than the 16-year-old because the increasing muscle strength does not keep up with the increasing weight gain. So the whole body strength is decreasing over this period of time. 
We also know that muscle length does not grow as much as bone length, leading to what we call a muscle contracture. So in summary, for CP muscle natural history relative to growth, we see that the muscle tone decreases, the whole body strength relative to weight decreases, and the muscle length relative to height decreases. Therefore, we have this scenario in adolescence of the child becoming weaker, less spastic, and with more short muscles. So what's the evidence that gait analysis, assessment of gait, leads to better outcomes? I don't have time to completely give you the evidence except to say there are multiple studies that show if you follow uh, recommendations from gait analysis, the outcome is better than if you ignore them, even in the context where we have very large variation, still interpretation of gait analysis and application of treatments. So does orthopedic surgery improve outcome? We really only have one study with a control group. It was performed by the uh, Children's Hospital in Melbourne, and they studied a group of children with spastic diplegia at adolescence, GMFCS level two and three, in which they were going to perform uh, multi-level surgery. They did an excellent analysis of gait, gross motor function, quality of life, and assessed activity and participation. They had a control group that had only physical therapy and a group that had surgery with physical therapy. The age was around 10, it was a small group, 11 in the surgical group and eight in the control group, but they were otherwise quite well matched. On the outcome, using the GMFM66, you see that the control group in dark green was a little better prior or at the initiation of the study, at 12 months in which the control group had only therapy and the other one had surgery, they were essentially the same, but then the control group drops out because they now have surgery. But at 24 months, the surgical group has in, improved. If we look at the GGI, which is another assessment of overall gait impairment, here lower number is better. So you see a dramatic improvement in how the gait function occurs after surgery with a slightly worsening in the physical therapy only group. But then at 24 months, they continue to improve. This is a general trend that surgical outcomes need at least 24 to 36 months to reach a plateau. When we look at the uh, child health questionnaire outcome, we see that the uh, children were also a little better at baseline, and they both improved and then the surgical group continues to improve, and that's probably there was not very much surgical effect in that area. So we also have a lot of long-term studies demonstrating maintained correction of specific gait impairments, such as stiff knee gait, crouch gait, equinus gait. However, we have almost no control studies to compare how the children evolved over time, which continues to be a major problem. With this, I conclude that relative to the natural evolution or natural history, there is moderate evidence that gait analysis improves gait impairment from childhood to adolescence. There is poor to no evidence that it improves activity level or participation. So, does spasticity management improve gait impairment? Dorsal rhizotomy has been a episodically popular technique to reduce spasticity. There's only one current long-term study with what I consider a good comparable control. And when comparing patients who had dorsal rhizotomy with orthopedic surgery or orthopedic surgery alone on a 10-year follow-up, they found no difference. Botulinum toxin has no evidence of any long-term effect, as neither does intrathecal baclofen, specifically in the GMFCS 1 to 3 group. Now, if we move to the GMFCS 4 to 5 group, 
we have very little evidence of the evolution of their function in adulthood. We have good natural history, though, on hip health and spinal deformity. We know that hip subluxation occurs on average around three to four years of age. Dislocation occurs between seven to nine years of age. And we also have this remarkable straight line correlation of the risk of hip subluxation to GMFCS and this same correlation of the rate of increase in hip subluxation as measured by percent migration per year by GMFCS. Based on this knowledge of natural history, many excellent screening and surveillance programs have been developed. Many of you are involved in these, but these programs are developed with the goal of identifying early the subluxation and applying treatment. The treatment protocols basically divide into either prevention or treating the deformity and hip uh, muscle release surgery is one of the preventive treatments that has differing opinions and outcome reports. Our report showed about two thirds of the patients did well at maturity. However, the, the report from Australia had less good outcomes. And it's not clear what the difference is. It's probably due to the fact of surgical technique and surgical dose difference, which is very hard to quantify when one is doing muscle release surgery. Bone reconstruction is one area in orthopedic surgery where there is widespread international consensus on the reconstructive technique. It has an excellent outcome. However, uh, in spite of the technical good outcome in maintaining a nearly normally reduced hip, there's no evidence that it improves participation. However, there is evidence based on caregiver outcome reports that it improves comfort and uh, care uh, ADLs. Other hip treatment options such as orthotics and physical therapy have no data with controls that demonstrate efficacy. There is one good double-blinded study with botulinum toxin that shows that it has no clinical impact on the hip displacement. The natural history of scoliosis comes later from the hips, but we know that its typical development is between 10 and 14 years of age. We also have the treatment protocols that surgical instrumentation and fusion is really the treatment of choice. Uh, curves should be fused typically between 60 and 90 degrees. And the outcome from this procedure demonstrates improved quality of life and it is spinal surgery and instrumentation that has the best reported patient reported outcome from families uh, of any of the orthopedic procedures we perform. Spasticity management in GMFCS 4 and 5 using intrathecal baclofen is the uh, current standard of care almost everywhere in Western countries where it's available. However, it's expensive. It requires continuous follow-up. It has a significant complication rate, but it does have multiple reports, again, of high caregiver and patient satisfaction. So in conclusion, we have a major problem in that we lack good data for long-term natural history in many areas of cerebral palsy management. Based on the limited data, though, surgical correction of deformities in GMFCS 1 to 3 improves and can maintain gait function long term. There is no data suggesting spasticity management improves function long term into adulthood. Preventing hip dislocation and correcting scoliosis improves the patient's quality of life. So what is our current state? Well, there are hundreds of, and probably thousands, of reports on short-term outcomes of many different treatments for cerebral palsy. So we ha how do we consider this short-term data in the long-term context? What specifically is the meaning of three and 12-month results in a two-year-old? 
Botulinum toxin, I think, is the classic example where we have excellent double-blinded research evidence of reduced spasticity and gait effect at three months or four months follow-up. We also have good long-term studies showing that botulinum toxin causes permanent muscle fibrosis and muscle damage. How does this impact the long-term outcome? We have neither the positive nor the negative effect has any data documenting long-term impact as to whether we benefit or damage the long-term function or have no impact on the long-term function of the individual. So what I think is needed is we need to develop a very strong focus on developing patient registries where short-term studies are entered and subsequently followed up into the long-term. We have to have specific data fields relevant to the treatment that is given. We need to include data such as social history, cognitive, and behavioral function. And we need a strong commitment to really follow up the patients into adulthood and understand how our childhood treatments are really making an impact into that longer part of a patient's life. Merci.